Yeah. Okay, here we go. Good morning. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Alyssa Yapel with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources and welcome to our webinar on the Underground Railroad on ODNR lands. So ODNR lands, what is that? Um, we're going to be talking about some of the remnants that you may find of the Underground Railroad on our state park lands and wildlife areas today. So um, our presenters, I will introduce them soon. I just wanted to let you know uh, the big picture that we're going to start with is about slavery, like the paradox and the receipts found. And then we're going to start zooming in on the Northwest Territory down to the Cincinnati riots and then the Underground Railroad and um, prominent figures and events of the Underground Railroad and then even specific parks or routes that um, were here in Ohio of the Underground Railroad. So if you have questions about the Underground Railroad and you're wondering why we're not getting to them right away, that is why we will get to them. So if you do have questions, please utilize the Q&A box. Um, we are going to do our best to answer any and all questions that you have today. And if you miss anything and you wanna go back and watch, this is being recorded. So you can go to our YouTube page. Um, just go to YouTube and search Ohio DNR and you will find us there. There's also a link that I published just a bit ago um, in the Q&A box. So um, I just wanna introduce Chuck who is with, um, with us today. He's going to be helping answer questions. And then um, I have Aaron Beisline who is one of our presenters today. And you will see Aaron in just a bit, but we are going to kick it off with Ann Schweitzer, who mm. is with the division, or excuse me, the real estate and land, gosh, Ann, what is it called? <laughs> it's a long name. <laughs> no worries, the Office of Real Estate and Land Management. It's there a mouthful. <laughs> okay, so okay. I'm gonna share the screen. Go ahead. Okay, is it up? I'm sending it live right now. You're good to okay. go. Okay. Like Alyssa said, I'm Ann Schweitzer and I'm with Aaron Beisline. We're from the Office of Real Estate and Land Management here at ODNR. Thank you for coming to our presentation. We're going to provide a little background about slavery, the Underground Railroad in general, and then Underground Railroad specifically in Ohio before moving on to discuss some of the parks and wildlife areas and other areas on ODNR lands. We'll be looking at events that happened at or near Allen Creek State Park and Caesar Creek State Parks, as well as Caesar Creek Lake, Eagle Creek, Wolf Creek, and the Appalachian Hills wildlife areas. If you'd like any information about additional reading or our sources, please leave a comment and we'll get to you with that information after the presentation. Okay, I'm gonna pass it off to Aaron Beisline and we'll begin with some background about slavery. Slavery is a harsh but significant part of American history. The period was marked by human rights violations, violence, and degradation, all of which continue to have lasting effects on our society. Next slide. The map shown here depicts the forced movement of millions of enslaved Africans to the Americas over a span of four centuries. Most of the enslaved people ended up in South America or the Caribbean, while others were transported to North America. Next slide. In 1619, only 12 years after the first people arrived to found Jamestown on the lands of the Powhatan Indians, 20 African slaves were brought to shore. Privateers took them from a Portuguese slave ship, headed for Veracruz, and sold them to the colonists for food. Researchers disagree about how to describe this moment in terms of the history of slavery in America, but they agree it was a moment that shaped the institution. This slide shows a, um, an example of a British ship used to transport enslaved Africans across the Atlantic Ocean. Next slide. Until the end of the Civil War, almost 250 years later, the number of slaves in what would become the United States increased rapidly. In fact, approximately 600,000 of 10 million African slaves made their way into the American colonies before the slave trade, not slavery, was banned by Congress in 1808. 
And by 1860, the US recorded nearly 4 million enslaved black people, 13% of the, of the population in the country as American born population grew. Next slide. That the development of the nation was so intertwined with the increasing presence of slavery is what Edmund Morgan describes as the central paradox of American history. Of course, the root of the paradox was economics. Slaveholders made an immense amount of money through the labor and selling of enslaved men, women, and children. According to Greg Timmons in 1861, the South would have been the fourth richest nation in the world. Much of the wealth was in the form of enslaved people. But it wasn't only the slaveholders who benefited economically from the institution. As is the case today, the economy consisted of a variety of interwoven threads. Next slide. Slaveholders directly benefited from forced labor, property value, and wealth. But the companies that used the tobacco and cotton produced by slave labor benefited from lower costs and higher yields. Banks accepted enslaved people for collateral for loans, even in free states. And the government charged tax on the sales of enslaved people, also benefiting the institution. And then because slavery was a taxable industry, there were actually receipts for selling people. This is a receipt for $600 paid by a slave owner for Jane, an enslaved woman only age 18, and her son Henry, only one year old. Even in so-called free states like Ohio, the attitudes surrounding slavery varied. As a territory, there were slaves in the region that would become Ohio, and the debates about whether to enter statehood as a free or slave state were heated. According to Emil Pocock, slavery and other forms of involuntary servitude had existed on both sides of the Ohio River since the first European settlements. Slaves brought by French traders and settlers remained in the Northwest Territory when it was created in 1787. Despite the declaration in the Northwest Ordinance that forbade slavery forever north of the Ohio River, the territorial government made little effort to manumit them, or in other words, to free them from slavery. Tolerated as well were the slaves that Virginia and Kentucky settlers brought across the river, often under the guise of indentured servants or coerced in other ways. This is a map of the Northwest Territory, one of the first ever issued. Next slide. Additionally, Ohio created a variety of laws that limited the rights of African Americans living in the state. Until 1841, enslaved people entering the state remained enslaved for an unspecified amount of time. It was only in 1841 that laws allowed enslaved people crossing the border to become free in some instances. Another law allowed only free African Americans to be employed in Ohio, further limiting their ability to prosper. This type of legislation was called the Black Laws. They were not repealed until 1787 or 1878, excuse me, more than 10 years after the end of the Civil War. And then this is an 1830 drawing titled Enforcing Black Laws. The drawing shows the government chasing and restricting even free African Americans. The legislation forced African Americans to furnish certificates of freedom from a court in the United States before they were even allowed to settle in Ohio. All black residents had to register with the names of their children by June 1st, 1805. They were even charged a registration fee of 12 and a half cents to do so. While there were many anti-slavery advocates in Ohio, there were also many pro-slavery individuals. And being anti-slavery did not necessarily translate to being an advocate for the free men living in the state. The Ohio History Connection notes that in 1829, a riot occurred in Cincinnati because Irish immigrants disliked competition from the African-American community. Um, the next year, Portsmouth residents forced approximately 80 African-Americans to leave the community. Often African Americans settled in the same neighborhood as a form of protection. In some cases, African Americans 
formed their own towns to maintain distance from people who might try to force them out. Okay, now we're going to talk about some general underground railroad information and just to give you a little background and knowledge on it. Okay, but before we start with that, it'll be really useful to know some of the words and phrases we'll be throwing around. Uh, supporters of the Underground Railroad use words railroad conductors use every day to create their own code or secret language to help slaves escape. Railroad language was chosen because at the time the railroads were emerging technology and new forms of transportation and the communication language wasn't widespread at the time. Um, code words would be used in letters to agents so they could not be caught if they were intercepted. Here's a list of some common code words in their meetings. We have agent, and agent is another word for a coordinator who plotted courses of the escape and made contacts. Conductor, this is a person who directly transported enslaved people. Passenger or freedom seeker, seeker, this is a person who was trying to escape slavery. We do use the word freedom seeker a lot in this. Um, operator, a person who helped freedom seekers as a conductor or an agent. Station, the station is not an actual railroad station. It's just simply a place of safety or temporary refuge, a safe house. And then station master, that's the keeper or owner of a safe house. And again, it's, this could be a barn, a stop on the road, a house, a basement, anywhere where somebody could have some safety or a respite for a bit from running and hiding constantly. Okay, the next slide back to Aaron. Life for African Americans of any status included dangers we cannot imagine in both slave and free states. The desire for human to not be someone else's property should need no further explanation, but there were a range of reasons for freedom seekers to decide to escape despite the genuine and dire consequences that they may have had to endure, including death. A specific instance of extreme violence, the imminent sale to a new owner, the threat of breaking up a family, or any number of violations could inspire someone to take the desperate step of escape. And it was a desperate and courageous step. Freedom seekers would not have any directions for escape aside from the need to go north. They didn't have supplies to take with them, nor did they have money to buy supplies on the way. As they traveled, Trusting anyone meant putting their lives in that person's hands. Okay, and then this print here shows a group of four black men, possibly freedmen, we don't know, ambushed by a posse of six armed whites in a cornfield. Below the picture is text from the Declaration of Independence. We hold that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's a very strong statement for something that really cruel that happened. Not only did freedom seekers need to avoid actual fugitive slave um, hunters, but they also had to be wary of anyone who saw them. Slaveholders offered rewards for the return of escaped slaves, and they were often significant amounts of money. Next slide. Additionally, just because a state was considered a free state did not mean that the inhabitants were sympathetic. The danger of being seen, captured, and transported south, often with considerable physical violence, extended to any African American, even African Americans who were born free. Stories like Solomon Northrop's autobiography, 12 Years a Slave, offer evidence of these dangers. The kidnapping of free people of color was much more common than it would seem. That the means of abducting the victims varied, as did the characteristics of the individuals and the location of the abductions. Many victims were children because they were easier to control, and often the kidnapping occurred in states like Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Delaware. According to Carol Wilson, one such case occurred in Ohio. An 1844 issue of the National Anti-Slavery Standard describes five or six men breaking into the home of George, John Wilkinson in Georgetown, Ohio. These men beat Wilkinson and his wife and kidnapped his 14-year-old son. No one knows what happened to him after he was taken. 
um, he may have died on the way, been sold into slavery far south of his home, or even in a happier outcome, escaped his captors and made it back home to his family, which was a much less common occurrence. Next slide. Because of stories like these, people across the United States devoted themselves to the fight against slavery. The Underground Railroad was an integral part of that fight. However, it was neither a railroad nor underground in a literal sense, at least for the most part. The Underground Railroad was a secret loose network of safe houses and paths to freedom, often to Canada or Mexico. The passengers were hidden away in underground places such as caves and basements, and conductors in Pope Patch, Ohio resorted to booking train passages for their charges to take them over the bridge to Canada. However, many of the specific details of the development and function of the Underground Railroad remains unknown. Next slide. Eric Fona reminds us in Gateway to Freedom, the Hidden History of the Underground Railroad, that after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Laws of 1850, materials such as Gay's Record of Fugitives, which detailed the assistance he and his colleagues provided to fugitive slaves made individuals vulnerable to prosecution. Few people were willing to keep those records and many records from the years before 1850 were destroyed. Conductors knew the danger those records posed to everyone involved. Before the repeal of the acts in 1864, only a little over 300 people were returned to slavery because of the restrictive laws, but it is estimated that from 1,000 to 5,000 um, slave es escaped yearly from 1830 to 1860. Next slide. Because of the lack of documentation, the majority of our knowledge about the Underground Railroad comes from Wilbur H. Wilbur H. Siebert's work. He devoted his academic life at the Ohio State University to the study of the Underground Railroad and its context. Without his work in the 1890s, we would have lost even more details about the Underground Railroad. His work relies on the remembrances of participants after the fact, which Siebert himself acknowledges is problematic. These remembrances romanticized the history and were often focused on white participants. Still, without Siebert's collections of these memories, we would know even less about the Rail Underground Railroad than we do. Next slide. Siebert traces the beginning of the Underground Railroad to the years following the War of 1812. He notes that the process must have begun with African Americans making their way to freedom in Canada. They would then return to the United States to bring their families and friends back with them to Canada. Word spread and as more freedom seekers made their way carefully north, more people became involved. This slide shows a photograph of Gabriel Hall, a black Nova Scotian who migrated to the colony during the War of 1812. Next slide. While many of the stories Siebert collects are centered on the white participants in the Underground Railroad, he very carefully places credit for its success with African American conductors such as Harriet Tubman, pictured here, and Josiah Henson. In fact, Siebert explains that by 1860, an estimated 500 freedom seekers were acting as Underground Railroad conductors, helping other people escape to safety in Canada. Next slide. This section focuses on the Underground Railroad in Ohio. Next slide. Ohio was essential to the Underground Railroad. More routes were active in Ohio than any other state, with approximately 3,000 miles of the route in the state. These impressive numbers were for several reasons. Ohio bordered two slave states, Kentucky and Virginia, as West Virginia did not separate from Virginia until 1863. Additionally, reaching Ohio meant there were only about 250 miles to reach Canada, um, a safe haven even after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. The Ohio River itself acted as a natural border between free and slave states. It served as a symbol of safety and freedom that would continue being used in literature long after slavery ended. The state was geographically important for the Underground Railroad, but it was the people who made the process a success. And then speaking of the Ohio River, <clears throat> this photograph shows the Freedom Stairway. The Freedom Stairway is a set of 100 steps that were used by freedom seekers to climb up from the Ohio River after leaving the slave state of Kentucky. 
This was at the John Rankin House, which is a station on the Underground Railroad located in Ripley, Ohio. Ohio had a large abolitionist population that provided safe spaces for passengers moving through Ohio. In 1835, only two years after the creation of the, anti, uh, the American Anti-Slavery Society, Theodore Dwight Weld um, and John Rankin and others um, founded the Ohio Anti-Slavery Society. On the left is a photograph of Theodore Dwight Weld and on the right is John Rankin, um, who is the owner of the house from the Freedom Stair Stairways that we just talked about. Um, and they are both founding members of the Ohio Anti-Slavery Society. Next slide. The members of the society continued to do their work despite significant opposition. They even held their annual meeting in 1836 outside of Granville in a member of the group's barn because the community blocked them from, the sit from meeting within the city limits. Anti-slavery groups were active throughout the state, um, including some groups whose membership was integrated. Some groups also focused on an African-American membership, including the Ohio Colored American League, which became the Ohio State Anti-Slavery Society in 1853. Although it was a statewide organization, the Ohio State Anti-Slavery Society was especially active in Cleveland. They circulated petitions both to end the black laws and to protect every resident's right to liberty in which shall effectively abolish kidnapping and man stealing on the soil of Ohio, to quote the um, petition. These groups were very active and made impressive strides politically. The Cuyahoga chapter even succeeded in getting the right of African-American men to vote on the ballot in 1867, two years before the ratification of the 15th Amendment. Although the law did not pass at the time, it was still a significant political achievement. Hey, Erin, before we keep going, do you mind if I ask a couple of questions from, from viewers? Perfect. Um, so we had someone write in and ask if there are remnants of the stairway that you guys just sh uh, had shown. Anne, do you? Yeah, I can answer that. Yeah, the stairway still exists. That's not located on ODNR property. It's at the John Rankin House, which is a house museum in Ripley, Ohio. The original staircase does not exist, but they did rebuild it. So there's a replica still there that people can go visit. Okay, and then one more question um, before we move, keep moving on. Um, have there been records found that named the people that helped the slave slaves through the use of the Underground Railroad? And I know you said much of it has been destroyed, but are there some? I think Aaron has this one. Okay. Yeah, there are some um, records. Some of it actually comes from people writing um, autobiographies after the fact. And then again, Siebert's um, history. And not all of the, the records were destroyed. Um, of course, some of the complication comes with the fact that there's really no way to um, check. So if someone said, hey, I, I helped 4,000 uh, freedom seekers during these years, because there weren't records, there weren't anything, there's no way to check them. And so a lot of that stuff has to be um, balanced a little bit um, because of that loss of records. And all of that information would be something that's available to the public, right? Um, Yes, the stuff that's available likely. Um, some of it's stuff that's held in different archives. Um, some of the original documents, including the um, National Archives in um, DC. There are some um, the autobiographies and things that you can get still in publication. Um, and some still like you can get for free on like Google Books and things like that. Um, it's I, there isn't a single repository of all of that information. Um, it's just spread throughout. Gotcha. All right, and we'll get back to questions in just a bit, but I'll let you guys keep going. OK, and then I think we're on the Underground Railroad in, in Ohio, so it's a great place to transition. 
OK, so next we have some specific instances of the Underground Railroad on or near lands managed by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. Just a little background on ODNR. It was created in 1949 with the purpose of maintaining and protecting the lands and resources of the state of Ohio. ODNR owns and manages more than 800,000 acres of land. Um, within these lands are several important historic locations. We're going to share some of the stories connected with those lands today. And here we have a graphic depicting Ohio with the ODNR lands in different shades of greens and the underground railroad stops and routes identified by Wilbur Siebert. Um, as we mentioned before, the Underground Railroad was a very loose network of houses and people. It's important to remember that escaped slaves reached their destination in many different ways. If there has been one route that was regularly used, the slave catchers would have known about it and would have shut it down. There were likely almost as many routes as escaping slaves. Some routes will never be known due to their secrecy needed to operate the Underground Railroad. And then like Aaron said, some we have records, we have firsthand accounts, or we have people claiming that this was their route. So the orange lines you see on here, they're all different types of travel medium. There's the canals, the Miami and Erie Canal. There's the rivers, the Muskingum River and the Scioto River and the Allen Creek. There's actual roads. We're gonna talk about State Route 555 in Southeast Ohio. That was a common route for escaped slaves. So, and then, you also have to realize some of these have a lot of branches reaching out. They were flexible. I mean, if they found out somebody was going to be around and was looking for these fugitives, they were going to change their route. It wasn't the same route every time, and these people were really, really flexible. OK, so first we're going to talk about Allen Creek State Park located just north of Columbus, Ohio. The park rests amid the fertile agricultural till plains and the river valley of Delaware County. And then I'll pass this back off to Aaron. Thank you. Uh, one of the most famous underground railroad routes in central Ohio was present day Africa Road. This was the setting of one of the most extraordinary chapters of underground railroad history. The tiny unincorporated zone in southern Delaware County, which was once the community of Africa, touches the southern border of Allen Creek State Park now. Before 1840, what was then known as East Orange was a rural crossroads north of the bustling town of Westerville. New citizens erected small cabins there as temporary housing while building permanent houses on their land. Eventually, the woodlands north of Westerville harbored a cluster of these abandoned cabins as folks moved into their more permanent homes. Um, Samuel Patterson, who had been living in the area since the late 1820s, played an important role in the development of the Africa community. He built a large house and a variety of outbuildings in the 1840s to expand his farm. These buildings also provided space to house people escaping through the Underground Railroad. Other members of his community also participated, helping those men, women, and children fleeing to safety. Records show that in one month there could be as many as 60 individuals moving through the area, but the average was more often a fraction of that. Next slide. The abandoned cabins became the homes for a new settlement. The community grew from the arrival of a group of freed slaves from North Carolina. In 1859, approximately 30 people joined the community. They had been freed from Orrin Alston, a plantation owner in Chatham County. Alston's widow Miriam left money for the slaves who she freed upon her own death to travel to Ohio. As we mentioned earlier in the presentation, the trip to the North was a dangerous one. Regardless of free status, African-Americans traveling anywhere in the North or South were likely to be subject, subject to harassment, assault, and kidnapping. And the Fugitive Slave Act made helping freedom seekers or failing to help capture them a crime. Um, however, in communities with large support of abolition, such as East Orange, the laws had little effect. The Africa community continued to be active in the Underground Railroad in the years to come. Those um, freed, freed slaves who had settled there opened their homes to help others escape. At least one member of the community joined the Union Army and fought for the anti-slavery cause during the Civil War. Many freedom seekers continued north from East Orange to the Quaker settlement of Allen, Allen Creek near present day Marengo. According to Cynthia Vogel, at least six and as many as 10 Allen Creek residents served as Underground Railroad station keepers. 
Stops in the settlement included the Allen Creek Friends Meeting Church and many residences in town. Three generations of a single family there served as station masters in the Underground Railroad. However, of the homes used, only one is still standing. Um, this is a picture of um, a historic black community in Ripley, Ohio. The community of Africa may have looked um, similar to this. Okay. okay, then I'm gonna talk about the Sycamore Trail. During the Underground Railroad era, Allen Creek was nicknamed the Sycamore Trail for the many sycamore trees along the banks. The trees provided cover as the Underground Railroad's passengers worked their way north and acted as guides leading the freedom seekers. The sycamore trees with its ghostly white bark is one of the most easily recognizable trees native to Ohio. Sycamores are often found lighting streams and rivers such as Allen Creek. Sycamores also grow very large, well over 100 feet in height and are really easy to spot. In this picture, you can see how the white sycamore bark stands out compared to the rest of the trees on the slide. And they're a floodplain tree, so you know they're gonna be growing along the river. So if you couldn't see the river in the dark, you could look ahead and spot these white trees and know you were still close to the river heading north. Okay, next is Caesar Creek State Park and Caesar Creek Lake Wildlife Area. Both are located in south southwestern Ohio at the junction of Clinton, Greene, and Warren counties. Caesar Creek Lake was also constructed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, like Alum Creek Lake was, for flood control and recreation in the 1970s. Another critical route of the Underground Railroad followed an old road known as the Bullskin Trace. A section of the old Bullskin Trace historically passed through present-day Caesar Creek State Park. Today, that portion of the Bullskin Trace is underwater because of the construction of Caesar Creek Lake. This photograph is showing a former enslaved person at the start of a trail used by freedom seekers on their way north. Adjacent to Caesar Creek State Park and also located along the Bullskin Trace was the community of Harveysburg. Harveysburg was founded in 1829 by William Harvey. In 1830, Elizabeth Smith and Jesse Harvey, Quakers who actively fought against slavery, moved from the nearby community of Todd's Fork to Harveyburg along the Caesar Creek. Jesse, a doctor trained at the Medical College of Ohio, started a practice in town. The family opened their home to freedom seekers moving through the village on their way to the Canadian border. Since it was mostly a Quaker community, it was devoted to the anti-slavery cause. Many Quakers, as we'll mention during our section later about New Burlington, moved to Ohio for the direct purpose of leaving behind the slaveholding states they were previously living in. Along with Harvey, Several other homes in the town are known to be stops on the Underground Railroad. And here we have a picture of historic Harveysburg. Well, in Harveysburg, Elizabeth and Jesse started the first free black school in Ohio. In the 1830s and for decades afterwards, African-American children were not allowed to attend public schools. Private schools like the Harveysburg Free Black School gave these children an opportunity to learn, an opportunity they would have not had any other way. On the left is a portrait of Elizabeth Harvey, and on the right is a photograph of students from the Harveysburg Free Black School. The Harveysburg Free Black School had several notable alumni, including orodontist Simon Bolivar Wall. Wall was born into slavery in North Carolina in 1825. He was freed as a young teenager and sent to live in Harveysburg, Ohio, where he attended the school there. Wall later moved to Oberlin, where he worked with other abolitionists to resist the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. During the American Civil War, Wall joined the Union Army and became the very first black man to achieve captain's rank in the U.S. Army. After the Civil War, Wall moved to D.C. with his wife, Amanda. He graduated from Howard Law School, an impressive feat for anyone, and was later appointed by President Ulysses S. Grant as the very first black justice of the peace in the city. Okay, then I'll go back to Aaron about New Burlington. From Harveysburg, the Bullskin Trace traveled north to New Burlington, located on present-day Caesar Creek Lake Wildlife Area. 
The history of New Burlington begins in the 1820s with the sale of land belonging to Aaron Jenkins and his son. It ends with the village abandoned and raised due to Caesar Creek's damming by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in the 1970s to manage flood risks along the Little Miami River. Between those years, the town remained small and agricultural. Its place on the an Underground Railroad is integral to the town story. Stephen Compton, a coffin maker, and his son, both residents of New Burlington, provide just one example of how devoted Ohioans were to the cause of abolition. Compton's family were among the many Quakers who traveled from the South because they were determined to stop living in slave states. Having been admitted to, into the United States as a free state in 1803, Ohio became a desirable option for those opposed to slavery. The Comptons joined the Miami Monthly Meeting in Ohio in 1805. John Baskin wrote about Stephen Compton in his book, New Burlington, The Life and Death of an American Village. According to Baskin, Stephen Compton would sometimes hide people escaping from slavery in a wooden coffin. At the same time, his daughter sat on the box and pretended to cry. Another time, Stephen Compton was caught hiding freedom seekers in his wagon and fined $1,700. At this time, the average monthly pay for a farmhand with room and board in Ohio was $11.10. And for a day laborer with board, it was $56. Um, the buying power of $1,700 would be approximately $50,000 today, an incredible sum of money. Next slide. Levi Coffin was also considered an essential participant in the area's Underground Railroad activities, but his significance is much broader. His autobiography is subtitled The Reputed President of the Underground Railroad. He estimates that he and his wife assisted approximately 2,000 freedom seekers in their journeys to Canada while they were in Newport, Indiana before coming to Ohio. In 1847, the Coffins relocated near Cincinnati, Ohio, where they continued their work helping, helping freedom seekers. Coffin and others would bring freedom seekers from Cincinnati to Stephen Compton um, in New Burlington, who would then transport them to Xenia. Next slide. The next area we will be discussing is the Eagle, Eagle Creek Wildlife Area. Located five miles northeast of Ripley, it contains some of the most diverse and beautiful land in Brown County, Ohio. Next slide. John P. Parker was a brilliant, creative, and generous man, and he was born a slave in Norfolk, Virginia in 1827. Due to this, details about his early life and background are scarce. In his autobiography, His Promised Land, Parker explains, as a slave, all I knew was my father was one of the aristocrats of Virginia. Whoever he was, he gave me a brain which has never failed me. He also gave me imagination, which was a source of comfort even in my period of despair. He gave me one more advantage, the power to hate. His hatred of slavery and all it encompasses gives Parker the perseverance to fight, not only for himself, but for others. Um, this is a photograph of the John P. Parker House, a National Historic landmark in Ripley, Ohio. Um, it was home of John P. Parker from 1853 to his death in 1900. It operates as a museum um, by, uh, by the John P. Parker Historical Society. Um, at the age of eight, Parker was sold away from his mother to a doctor in Mobile, Alabama. He learned to read and write, and he was allowed to learn a skill as an apprentice in a foundry. He used the money he made at the foundry to buy his own freedom at the age of 18. He traveled north working and eventually settled in Ripley, Ohio, where he opened his own foundry. Throughout his life, Parker invented and patented several items. He was only one of, he was one of only 55 African-Americans to receive a patent before 1900. Next slide. Additionally, Parker became very active in the Underground Railroad. He helped more than 440 people as they sought freedom. Eagle Creek, which passes through what is now Eagle Creek Wildlife Area, played an essential role in Parker's life. Because of his role as a conductor on the Underground Railroad, Parker had a price on his head of $1,000. One day he was taking a steamboat home from Cincinnati 
The other passengers for the trip included four men from Kentucky, three of whom Parker recognized as slaveholders. Unfortunately for Parker, they also recognized him and were um, interested in the award being offered for his capture. Parker spoke to the captain, who he frequently worked with for shipping his foundry products, and to the fourth Kentuckian, who Parker viewed as an ally. He planned to stay in his cabin until they reached Ripley, at which point he would safely and disembark and avoid the other men on the boat. Parker realized that he was in trouble when he looked out the window of his cabin and the boat was passing Eagle Creek, which was five miles past his planned stop at Ripley. He knew then that they were headed to Maysville in the slave state of Kentucky. He knew he was in terrible danger. He saw two of the Kentuckians were guarding his door and Parker and his traveling companion had to fight to escape. They managed to do so on a small sailboat, such as the one pictured here. Unfortunately, Parker's companion hit his head and drowned in the process. Parker himself also almost drowned in the escape, barely holding on to the boat. Um, when his companion's body eventually washed up on shore, Parker notes that his enemies made the most of the fact, accused Parker of killing him, and made every effort to have Parker indicted for murder. Um, our next stop is going to be uh, Wolf Creek Wildlife Area. In Morgan County, Ohio, scenic rolling hills and brushlands are crisscrossed by Wolf Creek and several of its tributaries within the Wolf Creek Wildlife Area. The area is crossed by State Route 555, which served as an important connection on the Underground Railroad. Additionally, the communities of Ringgold and Rawsaw were stops along the Underground Railroad, and these are adjacent to the Wolf Creek Wildlife Area. Wilbur Siebert wrote about the Rawsaw and Morganville connections of the Underground Railroad, which, as mentioned, includes State Route 555. He notes that Royal Cheadle lived in a small community of Ringgold. Cheadle's story was first recorded by F. Humphreys in the Underground Railroad. According to F. Humphreys, Cheadle's methods were as theatrical as his name. He wandered up and down the Underground Railroad pretending to be a half-witted peddler. He never sold many trinkets on his trips to the South, but after his visits to Southern mansions and plantations, some of the flit slaves mysteriously vanished. He had a gift for mimicry and amusing anecdotes. This made Cheadle a popular entertainer. He was also talented in composing and singing eccentric songs, which he used to entertain the slaves, win their confidence, and put them at ease. His friends were familiar with his hoot owl signal or his subdued knock in the middle of the night. In answer to their question, who comes there? Cheadle would hum softly, I am on my way to Canada where colored men are free. Cheadle said he was ready to leave this world when his work on earth was finished. He died in 1867, having seen the Civil War bring an end to slavery. Okay. Our next topic is the Appalachian Hills Wildlife Area which stretches across parts of Guernsey, Noble, Morgan, and Muskingum counties. This former mining land is now a vibrant recreational area managed hey, by the- Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Before we, before we move on to this wildlife area, um, I'm wondering if I could pass it back to Aaron for a second. Um, we have somebody that's wondering what happened to Parker. They said you left us hanging. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> he, he was not. Uh, found gu guilty of murder. He never, uh, I don't even think he was actually, um, he was never tr charged um, because it was fairly clear that the guy died because he hit his head. Um, and he had enough friends in Ripley that that was not a, a concern. And he kept helping. He kept helping even after that um, on the Underground Railroad straight to the end. Um, and then became really, really successful, right? Um, that was, he lived until 1900 um, in town with his own business. And, and one more follow-up question, is the school or schoolhouse that you talked about still standing? Oh yeah, the one in Caesar Creek is still standing. It's operated by the local community as their historical society. I believe it's been closed lately because of um, 
the COVID restrictions, but when this is all over, it'll be back up and you guys can go inside and visit. OK, awesome. Thank you. You, you guys can keep going now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. OK, so yeah, we're in the Appalachian Hills Wildlife Area. This is a huge area of land and it also abuts Jesse Owens State Park and the AP recreation lands. It's just a big chunk of property. <laughs> um, and on that property historically was the Lett Settlement. Right now there's a historical marker near the Appalachian Hills Wildlife Area, which marks this former African-American settlement. The Lett Settlement was a self-sustaining and autonomous community of um, African-American pioneer families who came to Ohio in the 1820s as free people of color. As Aaron mentioned earlier, African Americans settled in the same neighborhood and as a form of protection. Um, they would form their own towns to maintain a distance from people that would try and force them out. We know about the fugitive slave law, even though these were free black people. There have been instances recorded where free black people have been kidnapped and taken to slave states. I don't know of any in Ohio, but we've definitely heard of some um, in the New England states in those areas. So the Letts were later joined by many other black and biracial families, including the Browns, Clifford's, Early, Simpson, Tate, and Pointer families. They began acquiring lands in Meg's Township, Muskingum County, on the present day site of the Appalachian Hills Wildlife Area. Their community later grew and expanded to the adjacent counties. The families of the Letts settlement were landowners, taxpayers in Ohio, even before the Civil War. Like they were real trailblazers. They challenged the state of Ohio for the right to vote and access to education during the 1840s, 50s, and 60s. The Lett Settlement is linked to many accomplished people, including the attorney J.R. Clifford and the Underground Railroad operative and poet Joshua McCarter Simpson. And one thing to note about the Lett Settlement, it was actually located on the Appalachian Hills Wildlife Area. Unfortunately, before ODNR acquired this property, it was mined, so as far as I know, there's not and really any remnants of the community left there. It's all been mined, but at least now it's really turning into a pretty nature area, which I think is a nice way for it to end up after being mined. OK, so as I mentioned, many accomplished people came from this or have ties to this community. We're going to talk about J.R. Clifford first. John Robert Clifford was born in 1848 in the state of Virginia. There were no schools for black children in his area and his parents wanted Clifford to have access to an education. His parents made the tough decision to send him away to Chicago for school. While attending school in Chicago, the Civil War erupted. In 1865, at the age of only 15, Clifford enlisted in the Union Army to fight during the Civil War. Following the Civil War, Clifford moved to the Lett Settlement in Ohio to live with his uncle. Clifford would go to, on to be the first black attorney licensed in West Virginia. In two landmark cases before his state Supreme Court, he attacked racial discrimination in education. During his life, Clifford was a farmer, soldier, barber, laborer, teacher, editor, and finally an attorney. He continually strived to improve not only himself, but the social, economic, and political status of all African Americans. And then another gentleman who has ties to the Lett community is Joshua McCarter Simpson. He was born in 1829. He was free, but into severe poverty. His father died when he was a young child and his mother had no choice but to find someone who could provide the necessary resources for him to survive. His mother found an English stonemason that agreed to provide food, clothing, and shelter for her son. In exchange, Joshua was kept as an indentured servant to the stonemason until the age of 21. During his time in servitude, he taught himself how to read and write. Later in life, Simpson reflected that, I commenced and sacrificed everything else for education. Education I was bound to have, and I've never regretted my trouble. He graduated from Oberlin College, and after being called to sing, Simpson published original anti-slavery songs in 1852. This is among the earliest collection of songs published by an African-American and possibly the only abolitionist music collection composed by an African-American. His poems cried out for emancipation and were often put to popular music and sung along the Underground Railroad. 
Later in life, Joshua became a Baptist pastor and ran a storefront through which he practiced herbal medicine. These stories represent only a small number of the important and fascinating historical moments connecting the lands of the Ohio Department of Natural Resources to the Underground Railroad. Some stories will never be known because of the necessary secretiveness surrounding the activities of the Underground Railroad and the, un and the limited documentation of them. It is incredibly important for us to continue to share the stories that we do know and to honor those sites where they happened. Thank you. And then one thing I wanted to say, if you do have any questions or additional reading or want to know more about our sources, feel free to email us. We have a lot of sources that we can like share and we've read a lot of books. So if you're interested in more, feel free to reach out. Our emails are listed on there. And we have a couple questions. Awesome job, by the way, but we have a couple questions. Um, and if any of our viewers have questions before we wrap up, go ahead and put them in the Q&A box now. Um, but this is going back to the Freedom Stairway. Uh, we had somebody ask, do you think the top and bottom were camouflaged to avoid detection? Same for other pathways. Better um, the routes be hidden like a needle in the haystack, right? You know, I don't know for sure, but I would assume they would have been hidden. <laughs> Can I just hit on that? Yeah. Yeah. Go so ahead. a lot of these things were not. Um, they were not just for the Underground Railroad. They were also used to make them less conspicuous, right? So those stairs could be used by anyone to reach the, to walk up the um, bank of the Ohio. Um, and it, that is true of a lot of things, even as we heard with um, Stephen Compton, right? He was a coffin maker, so he would put people in coffins and drive them around because it's not weird for a coffin maker to have a wagon full of coffins at any point. Um, hiding in plain sight. Hiding in plain sight. <laughs> um, but there were also, you're right, places that they were much more secretive that were hidden. And um, there's also a story, I can't remember what person it was connected to, but it was somebody that, that we talked about today. Um, oh, I think it was, um, my brain is not remembering his, um, I think it was Patterson, but uh, he had built into his house this like tiny, tiny crawl space and you can see pictures of similar places with a lot of different underground railroad sites um, that it, it was just like this tiny door in his floor that nobody would ever like look at. I think they put like a rug and table over top of it. So it just looked like everything else. And then you crawl down in there and hide. Oh, something on that. Um, in Caesar Creek State Park, they have a pioneer village. And in one of the houses in the pioneer village at Caesar Creek State Park, there is a hidden area by the chimney. Um, I don't know for sure. I just got that information told to me a little bit ago, so I didn't have the chance to look into it. But they're hypothesizing right now that that might have been used as a hiding place on the Underground Railroad. It's also important to note that there, while there were these hidden spaces built in, like Aaron said, um, there were also a lot of hiding in plain sight. Like a lot of people didn't have the time, money or energy to build these elaborate hiding places. So as in the case of the town of Africa by Allen Creek State Park, a lot of times they just had them hide in the sheds by the river in the outbuildings. They were little used buildings. They were close to the river. They didn't need to build a whole hidden chamber for that. OK, and um, we have a, a couple people that asked, um, will there be a list of names and locations discussed today listed somewhere oh, after the webinar? Um, I know we will record or we are recording this and we'll post this on YouTube. Um, but is there anything more, Anne? Yeah, I can get a list together that we can post on Facebook of all the areas we talked about. I'll look into see if there's trails. I know the Appalachian Hills Wildlife Area is pretty remote and there's not trails to get everywhere and you do not want to get lost in the hills of Appalachia. <laughs> <laughs> 
So if you go to any of these, be careful and make sure there are good trails or roads and your GPS works. <laughs> None of which, right, people on the Underground Railroad actually have. Great uh, point, they, yeah. yeah there, there was no GPS. They just had to use natural elements to direct them north if they didn't have a conductor following or like bringing them. And um, uh, there was danger of falling and hurting yourself and you you could die of an accident escaping um, just as easily as, which I know is a terrible thought, just as easily as being um, killed or caught again. And I do want to answer too, I see somebody was asking about the life expectancy of um, slaves. It was about 20, um, which is horrible and I will acknowledge it's horrible. Um, it's a little less than half of the life expectancy of um, white people during the same time. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. But I wanted to jump in with that as before we got finished. Thank you, yeah. Um, and then I don't know if you saw that actually the next question on the list, if you had to pick a place to visit or learn more, which location in Ohio would you go to? <sighs> This is a ter like see, see Anne is also making we're like oh gosh oh gosh <laughs> um so much so much we would want we talked about this actually as we were collecting um we pretty much want to visit everywhere um <laughs> get the get the Ohio uh park pass and um do that and follow through all of those things um I will say Uncle Tom's cabin um several people mentioned that story within um she actually um Harry Beecher Stowe of course lived in Ohio for many years and she based that on a real story that um it, Coffin was involved in and I think Parker also had knowledge of so um, both of them talk about that in their autobiographies and they're both I will say Parker's autobiography I accidentally read it in like one sitting so it's really fascinating and well written um Coffins is a little drier that's, um, that's just another good place to visit is Ohio's really lucky to have this we have the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center Museum in Ohio in Ohio in Cincinnati it's an amazing museum and it's not that old. I feel like it's around a decade old maybe and it's gorgeous, beautiful, giant, big museum. And it's, it's an amazing thing to visit. A lot of the, um, by on purpose, a lot of the Underground Railroad sites are, are actually part of the National Park Service. Um, and so that's also a place to um, look into those things. Yeah, they have their Freedom Trail. They have their Freedom Trail, which is a, is a great resource. Awesome. Well, thanks again um, for your presentation today. This was awesome. Um, if, if you guys want to learn more, um, we do have some more webinars coming up, such as tomorrow at 10 a.m. Um, we will be welcoming Dr. Andrew Fate from Shawnee State University, and he is going to be talking about African American history in um, what was called Ohio's Little Smokies. And if you're wondering where that is, um, think Shawnee State Park, Shawnee State Forest, so Southern Ohio. Uh, we will be learning about the history down there and the all black CCC, um, the Civilian Conservation Corps camps that existed. And Anne will be back with us again later this month um, for some more CCC legacy history uh, so check out uh, our virtual programming page on our uh, website or our Facebook page, um, the events tab, and you can find all the webinars we have coming up. Uh, thanks again and hope you have a great week. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.